You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 454 of the podcast. And in this one, I got on Katie Merritt. Katie is a licensed clinical social worker, and she's come on to share her OCD story with us. And in it, we talk about harm-themed OCD, magical thinking, worries around natural disasters, sexual orientation-themed OCD, worries around her dog, exposure and response prevention therapy, and we discuss inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy, or ICBT for short, in much more detail. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. So thank you to Katie for her time and expertise. I appreciated it and enjoyed hearing her story. So thank you to her for sharing that. And of course, thank you to you guys for listening. As always, it means a lot. And without further ado, here is Katie. Welcome to the podcast, Katie. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. So you are a therapist, but you're here today largely to talk about your own OCD journey, story, recovery, yes. and what, what's helped you. So, um, you know, as I invite everyone when they share their story, you can share that now in as little as much detail. Okay. Whew. When do you want me to start? Where do you want me to start? Wherever you feel is, is the best place. Okay. I So I guess we can start at the beginning. Um, there... It, I had, I feel that I had OCD when I was very, very young. So there is not for me, like there is for many people, a before and after onset. Um, I remember having my first obsessional doubts as early as kindergarten or first grade. Mm. Um, So for me, it really was just something that I have had for as long as I can remember. Um, So it's, you know, it's a little bit hard to nail down the details about when this started for me, because I don't really remember a time where I didn't have it. Um, So most of my obsessions throughout my life have been centered around harm, around witnessing harm, experiencing harm, seeing somebody that I love experience harm. Um, And that was evident pretty early on. I also had a lot of magical thinking, especially around my mom. Um, you know, I wanted to protect her. I didn't want her to be hurt. I didn't want her to die. So I would avoid stepping on cracks because I didn't want to break my mother's back. If she gave me something, like she gave me a chapstick and I refused to throw it away because I didn't want that to harm her in some way. So a lot of a huge imagination, a lot of magical thinking in my early, early, early obsessions. Um, and, you know, it be, it's such a background noise for me that it really is a bit hard to draw a very distinct timeline. So I will just say that a lot of my themes revolved around harm. When I was a little bit older, I started watching really scary movies with my older brother. We would watch Jaws and Twister and Dante's Inferno. So I remember being terrified of natural disasters. And I live in Connecticut and always have. And so we don't have tornadoes here. Not, you know, not not big ones. We don't have earthquakes. We don't have volcanoes. We don't have tsunamis. The worst we get is a, you know, a blizzard and maybe a tropical storm. And that's it. But I remember having some really intense obsessions around what if a tornado spawns in my house? What if an earthquake opens up like an open in like there's magma everywhere? And I'm and 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 all, most of it was and I need to be responsible for keeping the people that I love safe. So I need to lay awake and think of a plan. I need to plan. I need to make sure that everybody is going to be OK because the onus is on me to protect everybody, which is a lot for, you know, an eight to 10 year old to handle. 
Um, I would rather be worried about homework and sports and and uh, boys than, you know, what if my entire family dies and it's all my fault? Um, and then from there, you know, it kind of transmutes as I witness different media news events come through. 9-11 happens. Now I'm really worried about terrorist attacks. Um what else? I mean, before that, Columbine happened. So I was absolutely obsessed with school shootings and, and thinking about how am I going to get out and, and you know, how am I going to protect everybody? Because, again, the responsibility is always on me to protect the people around me. Um, so, you know, around sixth, seventh grade, my grades start slipping. I'm having a really hard time concentrating. And there's other stuff going on in my life, too, that that was traumatic at that time. But but a lot of it is I'm I'm literally just I'm just ruminating all day and I'm worried about all of these bizarre possibilities and and trying to protect it myself and everybody around me. And then we get to high school and we start learning about, you know, I take my psych 101 class. And what do we learn in psych 101 is it was about schizophrenia. And so now I'm terrified that I might develop schizophrenia. Right. So it's it's just like this this magnet that just keeps pulling in all of these weird different obsessions um so gosh then what happened so i was terrified about that for a little while like what if what if i have schizophrenia and blah, 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 blah. and then um you know i get into a series of long term relationships i start having obsessions about the relationships what if this isn't the right relationship what if i don't love this person and um I also start having really intense obsessions about my sexual orientation. What if I'm, and I've always believed myself to be bisexual. This was, this is just a thing that I knew about myself as naturally as I know my favorite pizza topping or my favorite color. It just is. And then I start doubting that and I start worrying, well, what if I'm actually a lesbian? And if I am, then I'm going to lose my relationship. Right. Because for me, it was never about, and my friends are going to, you know, disown me. I'm going to be a target of a hate crime because I live in a pretty progressive area. So for me, it really is. And then I lose this relationship. Um, you know, it, it's, there's just so, there's just so many um, obsessions that I went through that, you know, it actually might be shorter for me to tell you the ones that I didn't go through. Um, but uh, so uh, one of the other huge ones that I struggled with um, on top of the sexual orientation was I, I adopted a, I adopted a very sweet dog and, 2010 and I had intense intense obsessions about his safety and one of my huge obsessions was um what if he got into something that he wasn't supposed to because I wasn't paying enough attention and now he's going to get sick or what if he swallowed a bunch of sewing needles and when I pick him up it's going to hurt him so I'm always terrified of accidentally harming my dog through my own cluelessness and my own neglect um and this went on for years and years and years. And I never got diagnosed. I did not get diagnosed. I didn't get diagnosed until I diagnosed myself when I was already 31. So I went through a bachelor's in social work, a master's in social work, and two years of clinical work without even knowing what OCD looked like. Mm. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. I mean, crazy, but I've heard it before. That's the sad yeah. thing, you know? Yeah. Were you, were you, um, in your clinical work, were you treating OCD at that point or had you not learned about OCD? Um, I was working in a Suboxone clinic. So we were working a lot with, uh, co-occurring disorders. So substance use and mental health. And I had seen in retrospect, a lot of OCD overlap with substance use disorders, but I didn't know what it looked like. If I can't identify it in myself, I mean, then I, I can't identify it clinically in somebody else. Fair point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying about Psych 101, for you, it was a trigger. I've yes. heard many other therapists on this show say, actually, that was the moment I realized I had OCD because it was OCD was maybe briefly mentioned in an hour lecture, you know? Sure. Um, uh, but they, it just sounds like they didn't cover it for you. Otherwise, maybe you would have clicked then. Well, oh. you know, I, re I remember in my master's degree, it's really funny mm -hmm. in retrospect. Um, and and we're going through case vignettes, diagnostic case vignettes, and we're practicing our our, our, our differential diagnosis skills. And I remember seeing, um, you know, this, it was a very stereotypical, oh, this person's, you know, door, you know, door locking and hand washing. But there was something about that that made me go, you know, that sounds, I don't have those compulsions, but there's something about this that kind of resonates with me. And then I went, huh, 
oh, well, and then carried on with my coursework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's someone in you that identified it, yeah. Yes. But, yeah. yeah. But uh, I didn't quite make the connection until a couple of years later. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And before I jump in with any questions, is there anything else you want to add to your story? Oh, yeah. You know what? I actually missed the whole part of uh, how I got into treatment and, and what I did and what worked for me. Um, so the the way that I got into treatment was I, I diagnosed myself. So my husband and I, for context, this is uh, this is either 2020 or 2021. We've just moved into a house together. Um, stress is extremely high. We've we've inherited a property that we don't we've never taken care of our house on and on our own. Financially, it's stressful. He had I think he had just gotten laid off because of the pandemic, um, and I am f- floundering in my community mental health job because that is take you know that's taking its toll as well. And so naturally, we're going to have more conflict. So he and I get into an argument about whatever. Who knows? We're getting snippy with each other. And I decide I'm going to take some space and I'm going to lay on the couch and I'm going to essentially I'm going to ruminate about whether this relationship is right for me and what if we're going to get a divorce and all the right all this other stuff. But I take some space. What I mean is I'm going to go lay and privately do compulsions. Um, and so I'm laying there thinking and thinking and thinking and I'm like, man, you know what? If, what if this relationship is going to fail and what if it's not right and what if I don't actually love him? And then here comes our old friend, sexual orientation, OCD. And, and by the way, what if I'm actually a lesbian? And I'm laying there and like a conspiracy theorist, I'm connecting all, making all these connections that don't actually exist. Mm. Right. And I'm taking things like way out of context, like, well, you know, I like women. And it's like, yes, but in context, I like women and men. But the the OCD is going to ignore that piece. And it's going to grab this information out of context and start using it to justify this obsession and make it really credible for me and really freak me out. And I have and I and I come to the conclusion that because I'm having this these doubts, these obsessional doubts. And because I've had them for so long, they must mean something. And it must mean that I'm actually secretly a lesbian. And so I break down and I'm sobbing and I'm sick over it for two days. And obviously my husband, since we're in quarantine together, notices something is wrong. And he goes, what's going on? And I say, honey, I think I'm I'm actually a lesbian. And I sob because to me, that means I'm going to lose this relationship. I'm going to lose this yeah. dream house. I'm going to lose everything that we're, we've are we built together. And now I'm going to lose half my stuff because we're married, right? So there's all this loss that could happen as a result of this, this idea that I might actually secret, you know, secretly be a lesbian. And gosh, who knew? Um, and I have a complete breakdown. I call it a work. I'm sick. And, you know, he grabs my hand and he goes, I don't care. You're my best friend. I'll come to your big gay wedding. You know, it doesn't bother me. We're still going to be best friends. I love you. And it's like, wow, you know, 10 out of 10 answer. He handled that really, really well. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then on the other side of that, I go, this doesn't feel right. Right. This doesn't feel egocentric. This doesn't feel like a knowing to me because a knowing to me is I know that I'm actually bisexual. And then the doubting to me is completely different. Mm. And so I'm sitting on the other side of this conversation going, that doesn't feel right. Something about this does not feel right. And I call my therapist at the time and she says, you know, that's not how how a realization is supposed to feel. She says, it's supposed to feel egocentric. And it, it sounds like for you, this doesn't feel right. She says, I think something else is going on. And I said, yeah, you know what? I think you're right. And so I hang up with her and now I'm more confused because I thought this was going to set everything right and it was going to fix it, this admission, right? Yeah. And So what do I do? I set to Google and I research uh, chronically doubting my sexuality and what comes out is an IOCDF article of are you chronically doubting your sexuality? You might have sexual orientation OCD. And I read that article and then I go, oh, my God. Right. It's like the closest thing to uh, us, like uh, just a, a spiritual awakening that I've ever had of, oh, my God, that's the answer. This is the thing that I've been experiencing for the last 25 years and had no idea. And I'm reading article after article and resonating and going, oh, my God, this is it. This is the thing that has been plaguing me unknowingly for 25 25 years. Here's the answer. And almost overnight, I stop experiencing sexual orientation OCD because now I have an answer and I realize there's nothing for me to figure out. And so I'm able to drop it, which was... An incredible 
feeling. I, it's it's ineffable. I, it's barely, I can barely describe what it feels like to have the scales lifted from my eyes and go, there's nothing left for me to figure out here. And so from there, I, I, I look up the treatment and I'm like, I got to, you know, I have, I have to get this under control. And in my history, that's always been the thing that I do when I experience it, something is I need, I need more education on this. I need to know more and I need to, and I need to, to challenge it and I need to fix it. So I make a couple phone calls. I wait, I don't hear anything back. Um, I get in touch with the only therapist to call me back and she calls me at seven o'clock at night and I feel this intense urge to like, I have to prove to her that this is, this is what's going on with me. I have to, I have to make her believe me that I, I think this is OCD and that I need her help. And she's extremely compassionate, very, very kind, very, very sweet. And she goes, yep, that sounds that sounds in line with, um, you know, your your experience sounds in line with OCD. How about we make an appointment and we, we do some assessments and we get you an official diagnosis and then we'll get you started with treatment. And that's what we did. And I worked with her for, you know, a couple of months. We did exposure response prevention. We did, uh, and we, we augmented that a little bit with acceptance and commitment. And I really did my absolute best to live the ERP lifestyle. And I found ERP to be incredibly empowering because here's this disorder that I didn't even know that I've had that I've been unknowingly living under for a long period of time. And then she says, here's the recipe, right? You're going to go out there. You're going to get stressed on purpose and you're going to practice not doing compulsions. And I said, I can do that. And I did that. And I, and I, and I really, really liked it because it gave me so much room back in my life and it empowered me It empowered me against this invisible disorder. I didn't even know that I had. Mm-hmm. And so I did my best and we've worked on, on reducing rumination. We worked on reducing avoidance and we worked on doing exposures and imaginal scripts and everything that we could think of. And then at some point in that treatment, I just kind of plateaued. I, you know, I was back to working and I could do things again and I could go places, but there were things that just kept popping up, right? There were things about this that that ER, it didn't quite generalize with ERP. It didn't quite respond to ERP. And I had kind of made this bargain with myself of, you know, I'm 60, 50, 60% better. Is that okay? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I can accept that. I can accept that I'm going to have this. This is my chronic illness. I'm going to have to manage it to forever. And if this is as good as it gets, that's for me, that's still okay. That's still acceptable. Hmm. Not to say that I wasn't a little bit disappointed. I really wanted to get, I wanted to get subclinical and I really did give it my all. So I'm kind of living in this like, okay, um, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm going to get trained in ERP. I'm going to start a private practice and, and I'm going to help others treat their OCD. And there was something about that that felt really hypocritical that like, I'm not all the way better. And now I'm going to help treat other people. And I'm bargaining in my mind of like, but I think for me, this is probably as good as it's going to get because we really did give it a fair shot. So from there, I get into a consultation group. Because for me, like one of my one of my my values is I want to be really competent and I want to know what I'm doing and I want to be able to help people the best that I can. And so I signed up for a consultation group with uh, someone who is now my friend and, and my mentor, Mike Hetty. And and he's talking now about not just exposure and response prevention, you know, a couple a couple months into this consultation group, but something else is coming out. And it's called um, inference based, the inference based approach. And as he's talking about it, I have two notepads open. I have one for my clients and I have one for me um, because I'm listening for any anything that I can I can use and I can apply to myself. And he's talking about this, 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 this definitely different approach from exposure and response prevention. And as he's talking about it, I'm going, this makes a lot of sense to me and to my brain. It feels like somebody wrote this about me and wrote this about my brain. And there were two quotes that he said that I jotted down that were that were like um, life changing for me that absolutely changed the perspective on my own brain. And one of them was in OCD, possibilities that are imagined are treated as more important than realities that are known. And I went, holy shit, that's exactly that's 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 that resonated with me so 
so completely like that is exactly what I'm doing, right? That I'm treating a, a, um, I'm treating a possibility, a hypothetical that I've come up with as more important than the reality in front of me. And that's exactly what happens in OCD. That's the way it through an, an inference based uh, lens. That's the way that we understand it, right? That the imagination comes in and that it, it, it eclipses our perception. And then we start treating that imagination as if it's more important than, than the reality in front of us. And I went, wow, that is something I need to, I need to know more about this. And the other quote that he said was, it's like walking into your house and smelling no smoke and seeing no fire and going, but what if my house is on fire and I just, and I just don't know it. And I went, Oh my God, is he saying that about me? Because that is exactly the process that I'm using when I'm engaged with an obsession. That's it. So it was mind blowing for me and converging at the same time is I'm joining this, um, at the, at the, um, the suggestion of my, my, my ERP therapist, uh, a lived experience group where we're all talking and we're all sharing notes about our recovery. And a lot of us are saying ERP got us part of the way and, and it didn't, it didn't quite get us all the way there. And somebody, and I don't know who, I don't know if it was me or if it was somebody else brings the inference based approach to this chat and we all start talking about it. And we all start going, this is something, this is really, really something. And we start applying it to ourselves to see if it holds any water, right? We were all of, all of us were our first clients. And I would say within a month, maybe two months of applying ICBT to myself, I'm subclinical for the first time in 25 years. Hmm. It was an incredible shift and incredible metacognitive light bulbs that are going off for me going, I don't need to worry about this at all. I have made this up completely in my mind and then decided to treat it as reality. I don't have to do that. I don't have to be this unwitting recipient of, of intrusive thoughts. I don't have to tolerate them because I can dismiss them because I know that they're hundred percent imaginary and hundred percent irrelevant to what's actually happening in front of me. And there was something about that that resonated with me so deeply that for the first time in my life, my Y box was subclinical. Yeah. Wow. Which would have been amazing to feel right. That difference. Yeah. It, I, the, the, the amount of space I have in my mind to actually do things, the amount of peace that I have mm. knowing that even if an obsessional doubt crops up for me, it's irrelevant. And I'm able to just dismiss it within a couple seconds or immediately rather than arguing with it, disputing it, trying to see it from all different angles, trying to solve it, trying to resolve it. I can know that it's false and dismiss it immediately. How, inc what, an, what a gift. Mm -hmm. oh, what 100%. a gift. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. And I want to ask you about ICBT in more detail. Uh, sure. which I will do very, very shortly. Um, but I just have one question before that. Um, your, your, uh, it sounds like you, well, you suffered in silence, right? For quite a long time. And it sounds yes. like you didn't. Yeah. I'm always curious why people suffer in silence. I mean, I did. And for me, it was shame and fear of, am I crazy, so to speak? And will I be taken away from my family? And then it had right. gone on too long to say anything when I was older, you know? Um, just, yeah, why was that for you, that silence? Um, well, there was a part of me that thought that this was normal yeah. because I did not have anything else to compare it to because, again, for me, there was no before and after. It was just this is the condition that I'm in all the time, and that's normal for me. Um, and But, I, you know, I didn't talk about it excessively to much of anyone, and when I did – you know, when I did bring it to a therapist, it was misdiagnosed as uh, trauma and anxiety. And so I accepted that answer and I didn't look any farther. Yeah. But you know what's tough about that? That e even if it was diagnosed as anxiety, at that point, you still should have been given ERP. Not always for anxiety, but generally that that is the go-to, right? So right. that wasn't offered. No, they taught me tapping instead. Okay. 
Yeah. Right. So they, they introduced a new compulsion uh, into my my compulsion toolbox, um, which was which is a real shame, yeah. a real shame. Um, the OCD was missed by every professional that I came into contact with, uh, including me, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, before before I, I got into um, treating OCD, I was working in substance use because I also have a history of, of substance use. And so when I got clean from substances, I went to detox, I went to inpatient, and I went did a 90-day outpatient. And every single person that I came into contact with missed the OCD. And so I'm here believing why 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 would I keep looking, right? If if I believe that this is this is the answer and this is what this is just what generalized anxiety looks like, then I didn't I didn't look any farther than that. Because many of my compulsions were um, internal. I didn't have any, you know, external compulsions. Uh, it was all, you know, rumination, internal checking, arguing with the OCD, having a lawyerly dispute with the OCD, right? R- ruminating, it was all avoidance. Um, so it was all internal. And so everybody missed it, including me. Mm. Yeah. It happens so much, doesn't it? And you don't know what you don't know. Right. right. Which, right. I think mean, it's so important, like the ISDF, OCD UK, OCD Action here in the UK, all of that, my podcast, other podcasts, other blog writers, all of that, sharing that information is important because if professionals oh, yeah. aren't aware of OCD, they're going to miss it. And yes. it's tragic because it's once you know a few basic things of OCD, it's so obvious when it's in yes. your room. It's most of the time there's the odd outlier. Most of the time it's so, so obvious. More yeah. than any other diagnosis, I think. And maybe I'm biased. Yeah. <laughs> biased. Maybe I'm just really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just really bad at everything else. Um, <laughs> so I don't spot it. I'm getting like tons of schizophrenia cases and just missing it every week. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Um, so, all right, so let's go on to ICBT. Um, yeah, I like what you said about being able to just spot it and let it go. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I use ACT a lot, 50 50 with ERP, sometimes even more ACT heavy than ERP, because I think when you do ACT well, it's basically ERP anyway, with some variants. And, you know, through, through using ACT on myself and in what I teach, what I see it when it works for my clients, they are able to notice when they're getting hooked, mm-hmm. notice a name, defuse, and let it go, which right. it sounds somewhat similar to what you're saying. I'm not trying, by the way, this isn't me trying to compare ACT to ICBT. <laughs> I'm just using what I understand right. to try and understand what you've achieved. Right. Um, so how are you kind of noticing it now and being able to just go, that's OCD, I'm not, I haven't got time for that. Right. So the difference for me is that I needed to know, I needed to know the why. I needed to know how it was working and I needed to know the why it was catching me because dismissing it for me didn't feel like enough. I needed to know why I was having obsessions to begin with. That's where where I got stuck with ERP. I didn't feel like it was an like the explanatory model was quite enough for me. And so for me, I needed to know I needed to know that the OCD was false. I needed to know that the obsession was false. I needed to know that possibility didn't matter. And I also needed to know why I was getting hooked by certain obsessions and not others. That always messed with me. Like, why am I, why don't I care about contamination? But I care so much about harm. Why don't I care about X, Y, and Z? And then I'm over here worried that my dog is swallowing a bunch of needles when there are no sewing needles in my house. Why am I so worried about that? And so for me, because I'm not only am I nosy, I'm terminally curious. I want to know. I want to know how this works. And I found that the, with the inference-based um, CBT, that the explanatory model was so much more robust. And it, and, it, and, it, and it made so much more sense to me than just, that's OCD. I'm going to let it go. I needed to know that the obsession was false. And in ICBT, we say that doing always follows from knowing. Right. So if I know that the obsession is false, it's selective, it's imaginary, that that, that just because an, a, an obsession is possible doesn't make it relevant, then I can drop it. But I couldn't drop it. It kept catching me. It kept 
telling me a really engrossing story about why it really could be true this time or or a story about what's going to happen if I don't figure this out. And that would catch me. And I had such a hard time diffusing from that. You know, even with ERP and ACT, I just, um, for me, I couldn't, I couldn't let it go. I needed to know, I needed to know why. And, you know, maybe that's where I failed ERP, where people are like, you don't need to know why, you just need to let it go. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I can't, <laughs> I'm nosy, I'm curious. I want to know why. I want to know why. I always want to know why. I'm an annoying kid in the back seat of the car going, why, why, why? Well, because I need to know. Um, and and ICBT helped me helped me know. Yeah, yeah. I will say, like I, ICBT does a very good job with psychoeducation. Um, yes. Yeah, and yeah, and I do like that about it. And and I've said it before on the podcast. I'm not. I'm I'm trained in it in the sense I've pretty much completed the training you and Bronwyn did. I didn't quite finish it because I had about. I had I had four other things going on at that time where I took too much on and then I never got back to it, unfortunately. But I think I've still got access, hopefully, so I can revisit it at some point. But um, I, I did like that about it. You know, and with my clients, not always, but sometimes I do bring in the whole obsessional doubt versus reasonable doubt idea and discuss yeah. that with them and um, reality sensing and all of that. Um, I just don't go through the 12 modules as of gotcha. yet. Um, okay. So you, you having kind of an answer. Well, so, so the answer, um, sorry, the, the, the knowing of like why you bothered about the needles and your dog, mm -hmm. what would you say to the, what was the answer for that? I guess. Of why so that the, and not, yeah. The, well, the, the answer is that through the ICBT lens, there's no such thing as a random obsession. Mm -hmm. And, and that I, you know, I would, I am very selective in what what I would choose to obsess obsess about because we have something that we call the feared possible self and and I like to say that it's the algorithm of our OCD. Mm -hmm. And so I am categorically worried about places in my life where I might be clueless and accidentally cause harm to someone through or something through my my own cluelessness. We might also say that, you know, maybe this is a negligence self theme, but the word clueless really resonates with me. So that's just what I choose to call it. So mm -hmm. so since that is the algorithm of my OCD, I'm only going to experience obsessions in possible situations where I might be clueless. And we can tie that back to my sexual orientation of like, I might be clueless enough that I'm not going to know what my sexual orientation is. I might be clueless enough that I'm not going to notice when my my dog is terminally ill. I might be clueless enough to not notice that I hit someone with my car or or miss the idea, you know, oh, that I might miss um, having schizophrenia, for instance, or that I might not know what to do if a tornado hits, you know, when I'm five or, or an earthquake opens up and there's magma spewing everywhere or, I, you know, that I might not be able to um, to perform and, and, and help the people around me. And so that's the explanatory model for why I had certain obsessions here and not over here is that I am tremendously concerned about being a clueless person that's going to accidentally cause harm to other people through my cluelessness. Mm. And so, for instance, and, and, you know, because it's not random, I'm also going to be collecting information wherever I might I might experience cluelessness. So if I have a, if I have a new dog. And I might recall an episode that I saw on TLC that had a dog, a dachshund that had swallowed a bunch of sewing needles and had those sewing needles in its stomach. And we, you know, we call this a mismatch error in ICBT where we go, that happened to somebody else. So therefore it could happen to me. And so now every time I pick up my dog, I'm worried that I'm going to put pressure on his stomach. And if he swallowed a bunch of needles, it's going to puncture him. And guess what? I'm harming him through my cluelessness. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I mean, you know, shout out to Mike Keddy. He's been on the podcast a couple of times before and he did come on to talk about ICBT. Um, and I remember him telling me that now, uh, vulnerable self themes. Is that what you said? Sure. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. moving towards something a little bit more specific to OCD and we are calling it now the feared possible self. Okay, Cause this possible is a, self. a possible self versus our real self. Yeah. 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 I like that. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm still getting my head around ICBT. It's still one of those things which makes me struggle as an interviewer to ask the best questions, I think. But I'm oh, trying. Okay. So, so um, yeah, that's interesting. I think, well, you know, and I think maybe in traditional ERP, even an ACT therapist might say, um, yeah, you've got this theme, relationship OCD, because it's what you care about most is romantic relationships. So that's why your OCD is is targeting that. But here, ICBT is kind of going, or you've got POCD because you generally are love kids and they're your priority in mm-hmm. life. And that's why your OCD is now latched onto that. ICBT is just saying something slightly different to that. Sure, because the, the fear of possible self is a result of a reasoning process in, through the ICBT lens that, that again, this is an imagined hypothetical self that comes in and eclipses who you actually are. Mm-hmm. And so in ICBT, that it, it's always about an identity. It's always about who we could be. And we pay attention to that possible self rather than, than living in our real self. And we'll do a lot of compulsions to try and not be that feared possible self. We're going to check. We're going to avoid. We're going to argue with the OCD. We're going to do a lot of stuff and spend a lot of energy to not be that person when we're actually not that person at all. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I think where I'm both impressed and confused by is... You know, where you say now, if you get triggered or spiked, um, you it sounds like you can kind of let it go in seconds, right? Yeah. So yeah. my my thought process is whatever the skills are, you practice them long enough that it's become automatic. In the same way, sometimes when I, when I use ACT really well, I can let it go pretty quickly, whereas initially it took a lot more work. Um, is that the case or is it, yeah, how is it your brain is able to just let it go and not get so fused in that? in such a short time. So it's, it goes a little bit farther beyond, you know, I've, I've practiced letting this go for so long and it, it, the way that it happened was when I learned that there was nothing that I have ever had to worry about in the realm of OCD, I was able to let it all go. And the obsessions would no longer occur to me because I was no longer going into my imagination about an, an about a hypothetical. I was simply staying with reality. And so now if that does happen, which is rare, right? Sometimes I still have what we call thought, thought fusion. I have, this is going to get very meta. Are you ready? Yeah. I have an obsessional doubt of, I might have a thought, right? So I, I'll be like, uh, you know, I might have a thought of harming my dog. That's not a real thought. It's a a thought that I have imagined that I could have. It's a thought that I am afraid of having. To me, that will that will kind of like show up instantaneously. It's like, boop, it's right there. And then I go, well, I know exactly what that is. Nothing. There's nothing to do here. So even if it does pop up, I know that there's nothing to do. And for me, it was that that knowing that's the difference between practicing dismissing it. It's because I know that it's nothing. Because I know it's 100% imaginary, I can dismiss it. That's the part where I got stuck, is I needed to have that knowing where it's coming from, why I'm having it, and why I don't need to pay attention to it. Yeah. That's what really was able to elevate my recovery, because I finally had this answer to Why? Why shouldn't I worry about a hypothetical? Right? Because, you know, we could say, well, you know, you don't want to have to worry about it because it's just noise in your brain. You don't have to worry about it because it's just something that your brain generates because it goes against your values. I needed to have the knowing. And that's what I was missing with other treatment approaches. Yeah, thank you for that. And I guess one you know, I know, I know I said to you, this is about your story and I won't grill you about ICBT, but I think I have one kind of question I know comes from a friend of mine that he it's, he's, but he's a very open-minded therapist and he's not close to ICBT at all. But I think one question mark in his head about it is, is kind of what you've just said, almost you've got that reassurance that every time you can remind yourself of this isn't, this isn't OC, this, well, this is OCD, sorry. And I can let this go. And mm-hmm. I know it's it's not that, 
but that's obviously I understand that's probably is kind of maybe a criticism and just good to hear your thoughts on that. Um, so to answer that question, I'm going to borrow from one of my other friends and mentors, Carl Robbins. And, and he likes to say that not all reassurance is, is compulsive mm -hmm. and not all reassurance is bad. And so if we're starting ICBT with this process by which to demystify the OCD and to teach someone why they don't need to worry about it to begin with is that reassurance. Because, you know, when I get this, this, this doubt, when I have an obsessional doubt, I'm not reassuring myself. I'm not going, oh, Katie, it's okay. It's just imaginary. You don't need to worry about it, honey. Just let it go. Right. It's, it's just, oh, there's that shit again. And then I drop it and carry on with my life. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. And one last question then, do you think for you specifically more so than maybe anyone else, do you feel you needed to go for ERP first to get the symptoms down enough that you could engage with this more intellectual side of ICBT? Or do you think you could have done ICBT from when you were at your worst? I think I could have done ICBT. I don't, I don't think that for me, that ER, as empowering and as much as I loved ERP, like, you know, we would laugh mm -hmm. through it because it would be so, you know, we would do exposures that felt and they would feel so ridiculous. And, and then I would yeah. feel so empowered and ready to go. As much as I liked it, I don't know that it was necessary for my recovery. Not, not that I regret doing it. I just, it, I think that if ICBT had been here and had been, available and I had been given that choice, I think, I think I would have been fine. And I think I probably could have gotten better faster. And here's how I know that I dug out my journal from when I first started going to exposure response prevention. And I wrote this uh, probably a year, maybe you know, like eight months to a year before I even knew what ICBT was. And here's what I wrote. I cannot continue to construct the narrative of what if, and I have to focus on what is. That's e ICBT language before I even knew what ICBT was. We talk about narratives. We talk about what ifs. We talk about treating those what ifs as what is rather than treating what is as what is rather than treating reality as what is. We go for these hypotheticals instead. And so I found this years, you know, maybe like a year or two after I did ICBT and was subclinical. And I was like, man, I, that's what my brain needed. I was already there without ICBT. I was already using ICBT language. I could already see through an ICBT lens before I even had a framework to work off of how that my OCD was working. Right. I'm creating a narrative about a, a what if, about a hypothetical rather than paying attention to what is. And so I think for me, that ICBT is what my recovery needed. That's what my brain needed. Yeah. That's yeah, that's a good answer. Thank you for sharing it. Um, so um, is there, you know, other than, you know, ICBT and, and therapy and whatever else helped you sort of medically, so to speak, what else um, has been useful at the time of recovery from OCD and your ongoing journey with your mental well-being? You know, other yeah, other things. So after I completed ICBT and got myself subclinical, um, I I started to I started to live my life outside of the shadow of who I was afraid that I could be. And, you know, we could, we could, we could call that act if we want to, um, we could label it as such where I'm leaning into my values and I'm, and I'm creating a life that is full of my, my values. Mm. And in my recovery, there's nothing that I don't do because of OCD, mm. nothing. So I put together ICBT trainings with my, my friends and my, my colleagues, Bronwyn Schreier and Gina Abandante. You know, we're, we're creating this business. We're knocking on doors. We're, we're doing seminars. We're doing talks. Um, you know, spoke live at ADAA for the first time, doing podcasts and and doing the things that I know that I'm capable of when I'm operating as my real self, who I actually am. Because the feared possible self is the opposite. I'm afraid that I'm clueless. There's nothing clueless about me. 
right? I'm not I'm not some bumbling idiot who's like causing harm and panic and, and ruining people's lives. I'm improving people's lives. I'm showing up for people. I'm educating people. I'm doing the dang best that I can. And even outside of my professional life, I'm doing everything that I want to do. I'm foraging. I'm mushroom hunting. Um, I'm a licensed falconer in Connecticut. Um, my husband and I do homesteading stuff. We have chickens and quails and rabbits and bees and food forest and gardens and, and all kinds of stuff. Because I'm not living in the shadow of who I'm afraid that I could be. Yeah. I couldn't do that. This is not a life that I could have ever hoped to lead, even in my best days with ERP and with ACT. I couldn't get here. You know, I was it, my entire life was a compromise between what I wanted to do and my mental health. And my mental health would take such a toll on me that I didn't have the energy to do anything. I was always trying to recover. I was always trying to rest and recover. And now I don't have to do that. I can just go live. And it's so cool <laughs> to have the life that I've always wanted to live yeah. because of because of uh, treatment options. Because, you know, I tried something and, and it didn't quite get me there. And so I tried something else. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good for you. I'm really happy it's it's worked out for you. And, you know, there's a good message there of of be open-minded and try different things because we're all human and different things are going to work for different people. So that's, it's awesome yeah. that you did that. Um, yeah. So words of hope for anyone listening, what would you tell them? Oh, keep, keep going. Keep trucking. Try to laugh. Find some humor. OCD is an extremely serious, it takes itself very seriously. And it makes itself very scary. And if you can poke a little bit of fun at it, you know, I think that can that can kind of lessen the seriousness of it because it's it's it makes itself seem so serious and so dangerous and the stakes are so high. And and when you're able to kind of step outside of that and see and I say this lovingly as somebody with OCD, how ridiculous some of the obsessions are. Have a laugh at it. Have a laugh at it. It's not, it takes itself seriously. It makes you terrified. It's not that serious. Mm. You know, it's just, um, and again, I say this lovingly that, that the obsessions are, are some of they're, they're ludicrous. They're ridiculous. They're designed to engage you. They're designed to freak you out. They're designed to scare you. These, these narratives and these stories. And when you can step outside of that, no matter what treatment you use, whether it's medication or ERP or ICBT or ACT or metacognitive or mindfulness, whatever works for you, try and find some humor in it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really important. Absolutely. Yeah, when you can sort of laugh at it, you show it that relevance and this isn't important. Yeah, this, yeah. absolutely. Um, so you've got uh, a billboard. What do you want written on your billboard? Oh, I have a billboard? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> What do I want on it? Oh, man. This is an excellent question. I had nothing prepared. I'm not going to lie to you. I had nothing prepared for this question. Um, does it have, can it be OCD specific? If you want it to be, yeah. Okay. If it's OCD specific, the tagline is it's 100% imaginary. Yeah. Now, that's not enough to somebody that's coming in your office to say, actually, it's all made up. You're fine. You're cured. We all know that this, that we've kind of come up with this in our mind, but it's about it's about learning how we came to that. That is that and demystifying that process. That is important. Hmm. But at the end of the day, all obsessions are are they're constructed without direct evidence. They're using indirect evidence, and that evidence is being generated inside of our mind. Right? It's a hundred percent imaginary. And maybe underneath that, it says in smaller smaller letter, letters, it says, "Don't worry." Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, and then if you could pick up the phone and call the, uh, let's go 20 year old you, what do you tell her? Oh, man, I would say, girl, don't change anything. Every single piece of your suffering, whether it's trauma, substance use, OCD, bad relationships, illness, it doesn't matter. Don't change anything. Change nothing. 
because the life that you are living now is the exact life that you have dreamed of. And if you change anything to try and, you know, try and change that outcome, you're going to ruin it. So don't touch anything. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, and I, I would tell her that, you know, show up, just show up. It's going to be okay. 90% of your life is just showing up. So just keep showing up. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Nice. Good. That would be a good call. But then again, yeah, like it's always hard because if you make that call, you probably do change the course of your life. The, and we have created a paradox here, Stu. Yeah. We created a time travel paradox. I know. <laughs> I literally had someone give me that answer once as I wouldn't call because I would change the course of my life and I don't want to do that. And I was like, okay, just don't take it so literally. Just give me an answer. Um, That's a really but... good out of the box answer, though. I know it is. Yeah. Can I change my answer? No. Oh, yeah, you oh. can. <laughs> <laughs> That that would be it. I would just tell her, just keep showing up and don't change anything. It's gonna it, one day. This is gonna be worth it. Yeah, a hundred percent. You gotta be in it to win it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, is lastly, is there anything else you wish you could have said or shared today? Um, oh, that um, is a self plug. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, because my colleagues, Bronwyn and Gina and I found so much success in ICBT, we created the world's first ICBT self-help with, um, in conjunction with Dr. Frederick Artema, one of the co-founders of ICBT, to increase accessibility. You know, and, and our whole goal has been let's get people trained and let's get treatment options out there. So we have ICBT self-help on our website at ocdtrainingschool.com. And if you're a clinician, we offer live trainings every other month and on-demand trainings to ICBT with the ultimate goal of increasing accessibility to treatment options for people with OCD. Nice. Nice. Awesome. And I'll put the link to OCD Training School on the website, uh, on the show notes, so people can click it there or just type it in. Um awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And thank you so much for sharing your story and ICBT. I appreciate it. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. And thank you to our Patreons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits, then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us, please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak... Take care.